Okay. Good afternoon. So this is the last real class of 1805. Uh, we'll have a review lecture. I might have to finish some stuff up on Tuesday, but I'm hoping to get through everything today. Uh, one consequence of that is this is probably also the most difficult class of 1805. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about graphs, and we're going to do some kind of neat theorems. Uh, but this is also difficult stuff, because now this is the culmination of everything we've learned over the last 12 weeks. Uh, I'll talk more about this uh, next week when I do the exam lecture, uh, but if you are confused by some of the things that I talked about today, that's not the end of the world. Right? The content for today is very difficult. The questions I'll ask on the exam will involve graphs and will involve some of this stuff, uh, but you won't need to know it at the high level I'm doing it at here. I just want to give you guys a flavor for what's in store next. Okay, so this stuff will become important a little bit later on. So last class, we talked about uh, a lot of things about graphs, and we ended our discussion talking about planarity. And the idea of planarity was that we don't really like drawings of graphs where edges cross, so wouldn't it be nice if we could draw the graph without edge crossings? And I show you how to do this for K4, right? K4, you might draw looking like this, but that's not so nice because it has edge crossings. So instead, maybe you could draw it like this. And now it's exactly the same graph in the sense that the connections are all the same. Each vertex is connected to the other three. But this is a much nicer drawing because the edges don't cross. And the question I posed at the end of last class, so this is K4. The question I posed at the end of last class was, could you do a similar thing for the following graph, which is K33. So remember, that's the complete bipartite graph with two partitions of three vertices that looks like this. So this is K33. Is it possible to draw that with an edge crossings? So who tried it? Wow, all of you. OK, so you all tried it. And uh, no one was able to do this, no matter how hard they tried. So uh, that is maybe an indication that either you are bad at drawing graphs uh, or that it's impossible. So I'm going to prove today that, in fact, you can't do this. This is going to be kind of a tricky proof. I'll tell you that up front. But I think you should at least see where your computer science career is going. So to do this, I'm going to label these vertices. Okay? I'm going to call this v1, v2, v3 on top v4, v5, v6 on the bottom. And the claim is that you cannot draw K33 with these connections without having at least a few edges cross. So at least one edge cross, we'll say. So the claim is that K33 cannot be drawn without edges crossing, so without crossing edges. And by that, I mean at least two edges that cross each other. All right, so let's make a few observations. The first observation is that V1 and V2 must be connected to both V4 and V5. Right? There's no way around that. No matter what drawing we have, those vertices have to be connected to each other. So V1 and V2. Uh, must both be connected to both V4 and V5. There's no way around that. So the situation we have then looks something like this. I have V1 sitting somewhere up here, V2 sitting somewhere down here, and V4 and V5 have to be connected to both of those. Right? So I'm doing my best to draw this with edge crossings. And I'll show you that I'm eventually going to get stuck. So this is the situation I'm in right now. Uh, but of course, I'm not finished because there's a lot more edges in this graph. OK. So V3 is another vertex in this graph. 
So I have to draw it somewhere, right? I have to put it somewhere. And it can either be inside this square. I've drawn it as a square. Really, it's just some closed region, right? Because if it's not a closed region, then one of those four edges cross. So V3 has to live somewhere. I'm going to name these two things. I'm going to call inside this region R1, and I'm going to call outside this region R2. So V3 has to live in R1, or it has to live in R2. So let's suppose that V3 lives somewhere in R2. So let's say V3 lives out here. This is one case. I'm going to do the other case later. So suppose that V3 lives in R2. What is V3 connected to? V3 is connected to V4 and V5. So V3 is connected to V4 and V5. Is that okay? Okay. So if V3 is connected to V4 and V5, what else is V3 connected to? V6. V6. So I haven't drawn V6. I haven't drawn V6 yet. So where could V6 go? It could go in a couple of places, right? It could go in here. It could go in here. Or it could go out here. Right? Those are the three spots that it could go. So let's think about each one of those spots. So I know that V6 is connected to V1, V2, and V3. So let's say it's in here. So then it's connected to V1, it's connected to V2, and that's okay. But it's also connected to V3. And there's no way that I can get out of that box and get to V3. Can't happen. Right? So that means V6 definitely can't live inside that box. So that's, that's not going to be the case. Could V6 live over here? Well, V6 is connected to V1, V2, and V3. So now V6 could be connected to V2, and it could be connected to V3. But there's no way I can get it to V1 without crossing a blue edge or a black edge. Right? I have to break out of that box somehow. So that means that V6 can't live there. So the only alternative place that it could live is out here. So let's say I put V6 there. V6 is connected to V1, V2, and V3. So I can connect it to V1 by going up around here. I can connect it to V3 by going here. And now I need to connect it to V2. But I can't get to V2 without crossing a blue edge or a black edge. So there were only three spots where I could put V6, and none of them work. So that means I can't possibly draw this graph without crossings, assuming that V3 is on the outside. Yeah? Uh, can't you like put V6 like right beside V3? Uh, what do you mean right beside? I mean, it's, it's either going to be inside here or inside there. It has to be on one side of it. So if I put V6 like here, yeah. right, so this is a problem because now I'm putting V6 onto an edge, so it crosses that edge. Any edge leaving V6 will already cross that edge. So I need to put it on one side of the edge. I can't put it directly on the edge because then I make it cross it. Okay, so all of this assumed that V3 was outside the box, so let's try to do something else. Right? Let's put V3 in the box instead. So if I put V3 in the box, so this is now V3, well then having V3 in there, I notice that V3 has to be connected to V4 and V5. There's no way around that. So I have V4 and V5. So now this partitions the inside of the box into two regions. It partitions it into R, I'll say, 2, 1, and R, 2, 2. And now a very similar thing happens. I need to figure out where to place V6, which is the vertex I'm still missing. So I still have R, uh, oh, sorry, I guess I named this wrong. I should call it R, 1, 2, and R, 1, 1. Doesn't really matter, but just to be consistent. So now I need to place V6 somewhere. 
Where can V6 go? Well, it's the same situation as before. V6 could be here in R2, it could be in R12, or it could be in R11. Right? Those are the three candidate positions for V6. So let's say it's in R11. V6 is connected to V2. So if I do it like this, I have to cross that blue edge or I cross that black edge. Either way, I cross an edge. I have to break out of that triangle somehow. So V6 definitely can't go in R11. That's not going to do it. What about R12? Well, if it's in R12, I know that V6 is connected to V1, so I get the same situation. It either has to go like this or like that, and either way, I cross an edge. So that's not going to work. So the only alternative then is if I put V6 on the outside in R2, and if I do that, well, somehow I need to connect uh, V6 with V3, and now I have to cross a black edge to do it. There's no way around that. So again, the three places I wanted to place V6, all of them caused some kind of crossing. So that means I can't place V6 anywhere. And there's no other spot I could put V3, right? V3 has to be in the box or out of the box. And either way, it doesn't work. So that means that I can't possibly draw this graph with an edge crossing. Because I tried every possibility, and none of them worked. Yeah? What if you uh, didn't use a box? So it doesn't matter that it's a box. It matters that it's a closed region. So for sure, V1, V2, V4, V5 is some closed region in the plane. It could have some weird shape. I mean, the alternative is that it forms some weird region like that. Or if it doesn't form a region, if it did something like this, well, then I already have an edge crossing. Right? So one of those two things has to happen. Either it forms a nice region, or I already have a crossing. Okay, so that means that K33 uh, is not planar, and that means that it cannot possibly be drawn without edge crossings in the plane. So this isn't a full proof. I did a proof by picture, which you're not allowed to do, but I am. But it's okay, because I'm not going to ask you to repeat this on a test or an exam or anything. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for this. So K33 cannot be drawn without edge crossings. You can't do it. Any questions about that? Yeah? Uh, basically, if you wrote down everything I just said, that would be a reasonable proof. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so there are other graphs that are not planar, but I'm not ready to prove it to you yet. I need to prove to you some other neat facts about planar graphs. So planar graphs... have some nice properties. And I want to talk about them now. So one property is the following. Let G equals V comma E be a planar graph. And suppose that little v is the number of vertices, little e is the number of edges, and F is the number of faces. So faces, that's not something I've described yet, but we already know what a face is by the last question. A face is a bunch of edges that close off some section of the plane. Right? So if I had a graph that looked like this, uh, then I have for now, we'll say two, but in fact, there are three uh, faces here. This is a face because it's a closed cycle of edges. And this is a face because it's a closed cycle of edges. In fact, there's a third face to this graph. Does, does anyone see it? Yeah, it's, it's everything outside. So all of this is the third face. So this graph has three faces. And the claim is that if you look at the number of vertices, edges, and faces, something interesting happens. And the interesting thing that happens is that V minus E plus F equals 2, which is maybe a little bit surprising. So let, let's try it on this graph. 
On this example graph, I have one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven edges. And I have one, two, three faces. So six minus seven plus three is two. Right, it's minus one plus three, which is two. Yeah? Did you consider like uh, the combination of one and two to be another The combination? No. So you only look at the, the smallest closed cycle. Yeah. So graphs don't always look exactly like this. I could have another edge sticking out here. So what happens if I have another edge sticking out like that? How many faces do I have now? Yeah, it's still three. Nothing crazy happens. There's three kind of regions defined by this graph. And notice that this increases the number of edges by one, and it increases the number of vertices by one. So now if I have seven minus eight plus three, uh, that still equals two, and everything's fine. Yeah? Tree still has a face. So, for example, if I drew a tree like this, how many faces does this have? One. There's always this unbounded face on the outside. So this has exactly one face, and it has one, two, three, four, five, six vertices, and one, two, three, four, five edges. So six minus five, plus one is two, right? Six minus five is one, plus one is two. So in fact, this observation that works for trees is really important. Yeah? Does the big uh, unbounded face have a name? Uh, it's called the unbounded face. Yeah. That doesn't have a fancy name, at least not that I'm aware. Okay, so this is all well and good, but you shouldn't believe me because I didn't prove it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline how one would prove it. So this isn't an official proof, uh, but I'll, I'll explain the idea. So, if G is a tree, I'm going to prove that this works when G is a tree. So if G is a tree, I have some number of vertices. What do I know about the number of edges in a tree? Yeah, it's going to be V minus 1. This is something we talked about last time. There's always one fewer edge uh, than there are vertices. If there were any fewer, it would be disconnected. If there were any more, there would be a cycle. And what about the number of faces in a tree? It's 1 because there are no cycles. Right? So there can only be one closed off region. So now, V minus E plus F, well, that's exactly the same as V minus V minus 1 plus 1. Right? I'm just subbing in V minus 1 for E and 1 for F. And V minus V minus 1, well, that's the same thing as V minus V plus 1 plus 1, which is 0 plus 2, which is 2. So this should prove to you that if I give you a tree, then this formula makes sense. Does everyone believe that? Okay, so this is kind of like a proof by cases. I've covered the tree part. What about if G is not a tree? If G is not a tree, then what do I know about it? Yeah? Right. If G is not a tree, it must have a cycle. And a cycle has to consist of at least three edges. Otherwise, it's not really a cycle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, G is not a tree, so it has a cycle. So delete one edge that's part of that cycle.
delete one edge that is, not, uh, that is on that cycle. So if I do that, what happens to V? V stays the same. I'm not removing any vertices. So V stays the same. What happens to E? E is decreased by 1, right? I had an edge before. Now I'm deleting it. So E decreases by 1. And what happens to F? F also decreases by 1, because I had some closed region before. I cut an edge off of that closed region, so now that region opens up, which means the number of regions I had decreases by 1. So F also decreases by 1. Yeah, that's fine. So in that case, we would have something like this. And maybe this edge here. So if I delete this edge, I have two faces before. I delete it, and now I have one big face. Other questions? Okay, so based on these observations on V, minus, uh, v E, and F, what do I know about my original formula? If E and F both decrease by 1, what happens? Nothing. Nothing, right? So if I have V minus E plus F, E decreases by 1, and F increases by 1, or sorry, also decreases by 1, well, What's going to happen, it's going to be V minus E minus 1 plus F minus 1. And this is the same thing as V minus E plus 1 plus F minus 1. This plus 1 cancels with that minus 1, so it's V minus E plus F. Right? Those, those are exactly, oh, I shouldn't have said that was equal. Those are exactly the same. So what that means is that, that v minus, is, so if v minus e plus f equals 2 for the smaller graph, then if I undid this operation, it would still be true in the bigger graph. So what proof technique did I use here? Induction. This is exactly induction. And this is why induction is so useful. Right? So this is induction in disguise. Does everyone see how this proof works? Does this make sense? Okay, so we know that V minus E plus F equals 2. And this is called Euler's formula. Uh, but then again, lots of things are called Euler's formula. So uh, when you're talking about graphs, this is Euler's formula. Okay, so uh, we can use this to prove some other nice facts. So I'm going to prove something else to you. So suppose we have a planar graph. I want to talk a little bit more about these faces. So how many edges are on the boundary of each face? At least. Right. There has to be at least three edges on the boundary of every face. That's an excellent point. That's a very good point. This only applies if I have at least three vertices in my graph. Then this goes through just fine. If that weren't the case, then this wouldn't be true anymore. So for example, in this graph, the bounded face only has one uh, on its vertex. So that, that er, one on its face. What about in this case? Is that going to be OK? Any thoughts on this? Does that violate what I just said? Every face has at least three edges on it. Okay. Um, is this likely to cause a problem 
It, it depends how I count it. So one way you can count the number of edges on a face is by walking around the face and counting how many edges you cross. So if I start here at this vertex, I'll walk around the face like this. So I'm kind of crossing four edges when I walk around this face. Because I start at a vertex, walk all the way around the face, and arrive back where I started. So in that case, I actually am crossing four edges. This is a subtle distinction. There's two edges in this graph, so there's certainly not four edges on this face. But when I walk around the face, I cross four edges. Just I happen to cross two of them twice. Is that distinction OK? Yeah? So if I just count the number of edges on this face, it has to be two, right? There's, there's no way around that. There's only two edges in the graph. But if instead the question I ask is, how many edges do you cross when you start at a vertex on a face and walk all the way around the face? Well, in that case, there are four edges that I'm crossing. Two of them I cross twice. But I cross them in different directions, so you could consider them to be different in some sense. So it, it, the, the important thing is what question is being asked. Right, but why do you cross them if you walk around it? So one way of sort of reasoning about a face is it's a closed cycle of edges. So you should be able to walk around that cycle, right? So for the unbounded face, this is kind of a weird notion. How do you walk around something that's not bounded? But you can do it. It's just you cross the edge twice in different directions. So if I wanted to walk around this face, I walk around it like this. And I cross every edge once. But you're not crossing the edges, you're just walking Well, I, I'm walking along the edge. Okay. Yeah. So I, do, I can do the same thing on the unbounded face, but now I walk across an edge more than once as I go back to my starting point, is what I'm saying. Yeah? Yeah, until you get to where you started. This is what's happening. Okay, so in fact, phrasing it like that is not a good idea, even though it seemed believable. It's not that each face has three edges so much. It's that each face can be charged for three edges when you're walking around the graph. Okay, so I'm going to leave it like this with the understanding that I mean not three literal edges. I mean three edges when you walk around them. Okay, so that's, that's one observation. Another observation is this, and that is that the sum over all faces uh, of the number of edges on the face is going to be what? Right, but then you only have two vertices. Yeah, I'm, I'm specifically, so, with at least three vertices. Uh, so what is the sum over all faces of the number of edges on the face? Well, let's, let's, let's do an example. So this face has one, two, three, four, five edges on it. This face has one, two, three, four, five on it. So let's, let's see what we've got so far. Right now it's 10. The number of edges we have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine edges, and right now if we sum these things up, we're at 10. But we're forgetting something, right? We're forgetting the outer face. So the outer face, I'll do this in red, has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Is that correct? This seems reasonable. OK. So what do we have? All right, so we have that the sum 
uh, over all faces of the number of edges on that face, it's 5 plus 5 plus 8. Right? So that's 18. And can we relate that quantity to anything? Right. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 edges total. So it seems like if I add up the number of edges on each face, I get twice the number of edges total. That's not a proof yet, but it seems like that's what we have. Yeah? I'm double counting it because it's on both of those faces. So when I walk around each of those faces, I see that edge both times. Yeah? So the outer face is still a face, so you, you always do count that. Yeah, so it, it doesn't contain the other two faces, though. It's the everything that's not those two faces. It's the complement of those two faces. It's probably the hardest part to understand about this is this unbounded face. It's always that little gotcha. Other questions? So to help you think about that, these graphs partition the plane into regions. The bounded faces are bounded by cycles. The unbounded face is everything else. So this plane, this face out here, this extends to infinity in all directions. Yeah? Cut out would be the two faces and the whole would be the unbounded. I, like a cut out on a piece of paper? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you can think of it that way. I mean, the paper is infinitely long in every direction, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have two observations. Each face has at least three edges, and if you sum up the number of edges on each face over all faces, uh, then you get twice the number of edges total. Uh, I'm not going to do a full proof of that last point, but the idea is very similar to the handshaking theorem, right? Consider an edge. It is either part of two faces, right, like this edge here, right? This edge here is part of two faces, so when I add up the number of edges on each face, I'll count it twice, right? I'll do this double counting. The other possibility is that I have an edge like this, and in that case, it will also be crossed twice when I walk around the outer face, right? Because I get, it gets crossed in this direction and this direction. And the exact same thing happens if my face looked like that, right? Then I would be crossing this edge twice as I walked around the face. It wouldn't be in the unbounded face, but I would still cross it twice, right? So when I say the number of edges on the face, I mean the number of edges you cross when you walk around the face. Okay, so we have those two facts, and now we're ready to talk about something hopefully interesting. So, what do I know about 2e? 2e, uh, so e is the number of edges, that is the sum over all faces of the number of edges on that face. Does everyone agree with that? Okay. So it's the sum over all faces of the number of edges on the face. That's basically what fact two says. Fact one says that each face has at least three edges. So that means this thing here is greater than or equal to three times the number of faces. Because the number of terms in this sum is f, right? I'm summing up for each face. And each one of those terms has to be at least 3. The smallest it can be is 3. So the sum itself has to be at least 3 times f. Can't be any smaller than that. Does that make sense? OK, so we have 2e is at least 3f. So that's, that's kind of nice. And we also know that V minus E plus F is 2. 
So if v minus e plus f is 2, then that must mean that f equals 2 minus v plus e, just by rearranging. So now I'm going to substitute in. I have 2e is at least 3f, and that is at least 3 times the rest of the stuff. Right? So 3 times 2 minus v plus e because those quantities are equal. And that's the same thing as 6 minus 3v plus 3e. So I have that 2e is at least 6 minus 3v plus 3e. So let's, let's work with that a little bit. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. I'm going to bring all of the e's over to one side. So I'm going to have 2e minus 3v, uh, sorry, 3e is greater than or equal to 6 minus 3v. So 2e minus 3e is negative e, and that's greater than or equal to 6 minus 3v. And that's, that's kind of annoying. I don't want to think in, in terms like that. So I'm going to multiply through by minus 1. And the incorrect thing to do when you're multiplying an inequality by minus 1 is to write down this. Why is that wrong? Right. When you multiply both sides by minus 1, you flip the direction of the inequality. You're allowed to do it. That's fine. You just need to remember to flip the direction of the inequality. Very common source of, a, of an error. So that says that e is less than or equal to minus 6 minus 3v, which is exactly the same thing as 3v minus 6. So that's, that's pretty neat, right? This says that planar graphs don't have too many edges. Because the number of edges in a planar graph with at least three vertices is at most three times the number of vertices minus 6. That's what this says. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? If you add in too many edges to a planar graph, at some point you're probably going to not be uh, able to avoid a crossing anymore. So planar graphs don't have too many edges. And now that we know that, we're ready to go back and talk about other graphs that are not planar. So this says that if G is planar and has at least three vertices, then that is true. So one way to show that a graph is not planar is to show that it is not the case that this is true. Because if that's not true, then G is not planar. And that's why the contrapositive, which we learned about 12 weeks ago. So that's why we learned that stuff, by the way. So this gives us a good way to check and see if graphs are not planar. So let's, let's try doing that. The next thing I want to prove is that K5 is not planar. So K5, remember, looks like this. And the claim is that this thing is not planar. And the way we're going to see that is by showing that it violates this theorem we just proved. So how many vertices does K5 have? Five, right? That's why we call it K5. How many edges does K5 have? Okay, let's, let's think about it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It has 10 vertices, or 10 edges, sorry. So, let's look at what's going on. If it were planar, we would have that E is less than or equal to 3V minus 6. And for us, that means 10 is less than or equal to 3 times 5 minus 6. 
So that says that 10 is less than or equal to 15 minus 6. So 10 is less than or equal to 9. And that's not true. So that means K5 cannot possibly be planar because it violates this thing that's true for all planar graphs. So this is another graph that's not planar. So, so far we know that K33 and K5 are not planar. What other graphs are not going to be planar? Yeah? Right, so why is that? Yeah, so the idea is if you have a subgraph that's not planar, there's no way that you can be planar. Because no matter how much work you do, there's always going to be this pesky little thing that's somewhere in there that can't possibly be drawn without edge crossing. Another way to see that is if you can't be drawn without crossing edges, adding more edges is not going to help the situation. Right? It's only going to make it worse. Uh, and the same thing is true for K33. So if you have a subgraph that contains K5 or K33, then you're definitely not planar. And the really interesting thing is it turns out that these are essentially all of the graphs that are not planar. So to do that, you need something slightly different. It's not the same as being a subgraph. Uh, it's called a minor graph that consists of K33 or K5. So I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you what that means. So let's say I had a graph that looks like this. This is K5. Would the situation be drastically different if I added a vertex here, 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 and here? Would that help me in any way? No, right? The only thing that you might get by adding a vertex like that is the ability to bend. But you can already bend. It doesn't matter if the graph is drawn in straight lines or not. So this graph is not K5, right? It's not K5 because it has 10 vertices instead of 5. But it's a lot like K5. So we say this graph has a K5 minor. Yep? Could you not make it clear by adding a vertex to every edge crossing? Yes. So if you add, add vertices, then yes, you, you can do this kind of thing. So for example, uh, if, I, if I had this graph and I added vertices there, 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 and there, uh, well, yes, that becomes planar, uh, but it's not my original graph. And as it turns out, this is not a minor K5 anyway. Yep. Uh, these kind of graphs where you add in vertices at the intersection? Uh, probably. I, I, I don't know enough about my own. Um, okay, so that, that's pretty interesting. Every graph that is not planar has K33 or K5 hidden somewhere inside of it. Now, what I mean by hidden is this idea of being a minor, uh, but that's quite a bit more advanced than I, I would like to talk about in this course. But K3, 3, and K5 are really the only non-planar graphs uh, if you take this hidden thing to mean the right thing. OK, so uh, that's a good bit of discussion on planarity. Uh, there's other nice properties of planarity that I'll need in a little bit, so I'm going to talk about them now. So another nice property of planarity is that if G equals V comma E is a planar graph uh, that is connected. So all of this stuff is for connected graphs, I should have said. Uh, then G has a vertex of degree at most 5. So somewhere in that planar graph, there's a vertex that has relatively small degree. It's at most 5. So there's always at least one vertex that has degree that's kind of small. All right, so let's, let's try to prove this. And I'll do it using a series of observations. 
So if G has one or two vertices, uh, then does it follow? Yeah, because the biggest the degrees could be is one. It could connect to the other vertex and that's it. So that's, that's easy. Otherwise, G has at least three vertices. And if G has at least three vertices, then the theorem we just had about E is less than or equal to 3B minus 6, that has to apply. So the size of E is at most 3 times the size of B minus 6. So I have this inequality here. And I'm going to multiply both sides of that inequality by 2. So 2 times E is less than or equal to 6B minus 12. And that's, that's kind of weird. Why might I want to do that? Where have we seen something before? So we've seen the 2E before, right? We know that 2E is equal to the sum over all vertices of the degree of the vertex. Right? Okay, so let's say that this theorem was wrong. Let's say that it was not the case that there was always a, a vertex of degree at most 5. So suppose there is not a vertex of degree at most 5. What does that mean? Right, if there's nothing of degree 5, then everything has at least degree 6. And if every vertex has degree at least 6, then what do I know about the sum of the vertices? Right, it has to be at least 6 times the number of vertices. There's V many terms in that sum, and each one of them has to be at least 6. So this says that the sum of all the degrees is at least 6V, and this says that the sum of all the vertices is at most 6V minus 12. So we have that the sum over all vertices of the degree of the vertex is at least 6V, and we also have the sum of all the degrees is at most 6V minus 12. So is this a good situation to be in? Well, it's, it's good for us because we want to prove that it's true. You can't simultaneously be more than 6v and less than or equal to 6v minus 12. That, that can't happen. There's no way that these inequalities can both be true. And if they can't both be true, then we have a contradiction. So this is a contradiction of the fact that there is not a vertex of degree at most 5. So that means there always is a vertex of degree at most 5. Does that make sense? All right. So the other nice thing about planar graphs have sm they have small average degree. So if you go through and you add up the degrees of all of the vertices in the graph, that's a relatively small number. Right? That's the average. So what is the average degree of a graph? And this is for any graph, not just for a planar graph. Well, the average of the degrees is you sum up all of the degrees 
and you divide through by the number of vertices. Right? So it's the sum over all v in your vertex set of the degree of v divided by the number of vertices in your graph. So we already know that if you add up all the vertices, you get twice the number of edges, and then you divide through by the number of vertices. So the average degree of any graph, not just a planar graph, uh, is twice the number of edges divided by the number of vertices. That's the average degree. But we know that we're in a planar graph. So we know that twice the number of edges divided by the number of vertices is at most 2 times 3 times the number of vertices minus 6 divided by the number of vertices. And if you do a little bit of rearranging, you'll see that this thing is not more than 6 minus 12 over the number of vertices. And that's definitely at most 6, right? Because as the ver number of vertices grows larger and larger and larger, uh, 12 over V grows smaller and smaller and smaller, which means the thing gets closer and closer and closer to 6. So the average degree of a planar graph is about 6. So we already knew that planar graphs have at least one vertex of small degree, but in fact, on average, the degree is very small too. And this ties back with the fact that there shouldn't be too many edges in a planar graph, because if there are a lot of edges, then you'll probably get a crossing. Right? That's not a proof, that's just intuition. Other questions about this? All right, so that's everything I want to say about planar graphs. The very last topic in this course is graph coloring. And this is something I alluded to when we were talking about uh, bipartite graphs. So a lot of applications in the real world can be modeled as graph questions or problems on graphs. And one recurring such thing is to color a graph. So to color a graph means to assign a color to every vertex of the graph uh, such that no two adjacent vertices share the same color. That's what it means to color a graph. Is that definition clear? Okay, so an example of this would be, let's say we have a graph of all courses at Carleton. Uh, and in that graph, two courses are connected by an edge if there is a common student in, e uh, in the two classes. So for example, some of you are in this class and in my comp 1406. So comp 1805 and comp 1406 would be connected by an edge. Okay. Um, so at some point, Carlton will say, okay, well, I need to schedule some exams. So it's probably a good idea if students don't have conflicts in their exam schedule, although it still does happen. So what we could do is assign a time slot to each course such that two courses that are connected don't have the same time slot. Because if two courses are connected, then they share students, so they can't write at the same time for those two exams. So assigning a time slot is really the same thing as assigning a color. We just like to say color because it's simple and applies to everything. Right? So maybe at the end of the process, you know, the people with, uh, or the courses with the blue color, they write on you know, Saturday at 2 or whatever. And people with the red color, they write on Saturday at 7 or whatever. So this is the idea behind coloring. So a coloring of a simple graph is the assignment of a color to each vertex of the graph such that no two adjacent vertices are assigned the same color. Now, this isn't too hard to do if you don't care about how many colors you assign, right? If Carleton is scheduling exams for you guys, they could have a separate time slot for every single course at Carleton. Uh, but then we'd be here for months and months and months. And that's, that's not a good idea. Carleton wants to avoid these conflicts, but at the same time, it doesn't want to have, you know, a thousand different exam time slots. 
So we try to be a little bit smarter about it and use as few time slots as we can. And in a graph, we try to color it such that no two vertices uh, share color of the adjacent in such a way that we use as few colors as possible. So that's our goal. That's what we'd like to do. The fewest number of colors you can use to color a particular graph is called the graph's chromatic number. So the chromatic number of a graph, let's say G, is the smallest number of colors Uh, required to color the graph. And it's usually denoted uh, by chi of g. So it's like a cursive x. So that's the smallest number of colors you need to uh, color a graph. So let's talk about some examples of graphs then. So for example, the complete graph on n vertices. What's the chromatic number of kn? Probably n, right? I definitely need to assign each vertex a different color because every vertex is connected to every other vertex. So the chromatic number of kn is n. What about KMN, the complete bipartite graph with partition size M and N. What's its chromatic number going to be? Not quite. So where do the edges go in a bipartite graph? They go between the partitions. They never go within a partition. And there's two partitions, so yeah, I just need two. So for example, if I had 3, 3, well, I could color all the top ones red, all of the bottom ones blue. There's never any edges between two bottom ones and never any edges between two top ones. That's the point of this graph. So I can get away with 2. What about the chromatic number of the cycle on n vertices, Cn? This one's a little bit trickier. Yeah? Sometimes. It's two about half the time. Yeah, it depends on whether it's even or odd. So when n is even, it's two. And when it's odd, it's three. And if you forget that fact, just do a quick little example. This is C3, and C3 happens to be the same as K3, so I need three colors. This is C4, and I only need two colors because I can alternate. You can't alternate if it's odd because you get stuck when you get back to the beginning. So one particularly interesting thing, uh, sorry, before I, I do this, I should make one remark. And that is, what's the smallest a chromatic number can be, regardless of the graph? Right, the smallest it can be is 1, and that's when I just have this. So 1, or sorry, the chromatic number of a graph is between 1, and what's the biggest it can be? Well, not infinity, the number of vertices, yeah. So the chromatic number is between 1 and n, and this is when you have kn, this is when you have a single vertex, and it's somewhere in between there. So one really interesting case uh, is the case of planar graphs, the chromatic number of planar graphs. So the chromatic number of planar graphs uh, there's a couple proofs about this. 
I'm going to show you one that's hopefully not too hard. The chromatic number of, the pl of a planar graph is at most six. So I'll prove that for you. The proof is going to be uh, by induction. And it's going to be by induction on the number of vertices. So in the basis step, let's say I have some graph with at most six vertices. Right? It doesn't really matter which one I do because these are all easy. If there's at most six vertices, well, then the chromatic number is at most six. That's easy. Our inductive hypothesis will be that any simple planar graph on n vertices can be colored with at most six colors. So the n is arbitrary, but it's for any graph with n vertices. So n is the thing I'm doing induction on, so it's the thing I don't get to choose. But I am going to prove that it works for any graph on n vertices. So any simple planar graph on n vertices has chromatic number 6. for some n. So n is the thing that I don't get control over. All right, so let's do the inductive step. So let G be some simple planar graph on n plus 1 vertices. Yes. Uh, be a simple planar graph on n plus 1 vertices. Okay, so the usual trick is we have this big instance and we want to go to a smaller instance. And the way we do that is we remove a vertex. But I'm not just going to remove any vertex. I'm going to remove a vertex that has small degree. So by this result up over here, G has a vertex of degree at most 5. So G has a vertex of degree at most 5. So I'm going to remove it. When I remove it, I get a simple planar graph on n vertices. Right? If I remove a vertex from a planar graph, what I get is still going to be planar. So I can color that with at most six colors. So the remaining graph can be colored with at most six colors. Right? That's by the inductive hypothesis. Now I'm going to add the vertex I removed back in. So when I add that vertex back in, I now have a coloring for the entire graph except this last vertex. So what color do I give this last vertex? Yeah. Right. It's adjacent to five things and only five things. So I can't use any one of those five colors, but I still have a sixth color that I'm allowed to use. So I use it. So it has at most five neighbors, and therefore there is still a free color. So I only need six colors and then I'm done. Does 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so uh, planar graphs have chromatic number uh, at most six, which is interesting. You can actually get that down a bit further, but it becomes very tricky. In general, computing the chromatic number of a general graph is quite tricky. We don't know a way to do it. So the problem is this. If I give you a graph G, you tell me what chi G is. Uh, no one knows how to do that very well. That's, that's an open problem. It seems like it's very, very difficult. A lot of really smart people have worked on it, and we haven't got anywhere. Uh, by efficient algorithm, I mean one that takes polynomial time. So n to the some constant. Could even be n to the 100. That would still be pretty impressive. We don't even know how to do that. What we do know how to do is things that take exponential time. So 2 to the n or something like that. And if you think back to, I think, assignment 3, we know that's pretty bad. Right? Things that take exponential time, that was the last one in that time question. Uh, that was years and years and years, centuries and centuries, eons and eons. It's not going to work for large graphs. Yeah? Yep. So I take out the vertex that has degree at most 5, and that leaves a graph with n vertices. So by the inductive hypothesis, I can color that with at most 6 colors. So now I put this vertex back in. It has degree at most 5, so it's adjacent to at most 5 of those colors, which means there's always at least one free color that I can use for it. Those ones have to be different, yeah. At, at most five, right? It could be like three or something, but it's at most five. Okay, so we're not very good at uh, figuring out chi g for general graph g unless we know something else about the graph. So, for example, if we know the graph is planar, then we're a little bit better at figuring out what the uh, chromatic number is. Okay, so that brings up the question, well... What if we don't want the single best coloring? What if we'd settle for a pretty good coloring? Because a lot of people have worked on finding the best one for a long time. No one's been smart enough to do it. So if we want to solve these problems, we need to do something. So what we concentrate on is getting some coloring that doesn't use too many colors. And that's something we're a little bit better at doing. Uh, one thing you can do is what's called the greedy coloring. So the way it works is you order the vertices in some fixed way. So you go through all the vertices and say, you're first, you're second, you're third, you're fourth, you're fifth, and so on. You could just go alphabetically, that's fine too. But the point is you need some fixed order. And then you go through and you assign each vertex in sequence the smallest available color not already used by one of its neighbors. So the trick here is the first step. The trick is putting the vertices in a good order. Because depending on the order you put them in, you could get a very good coloring or a very bad coloring. Where good means few colors, bad means lots of colors. So it turns out 
that if you're really, really good at finding orderings, there is an ordering that will produce kaiji many colors. It's just we don't know how to find that ordering. If we knew how to find that ordering, we'd be able to solve the problem. But there are some orders that are still pretty good. But the problem is, is there's also orders that are really, really bad. So I, I'm going to do a few examples. So I'm going to draw a graph that's sort of like K44, except it's got the horizontal edges missing. So it looks like this. This is my graph. And I'm going to make two copies of this graph because I can number it in two ways. So I'm going to show you both reasonable ways of numbering it. OK. So here's one way. Oops. I could number it going alternating side to side. Right, I could number this one, or let me do it to the side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's one reasonable way of ordering it. Another reasonable way of ordering it would be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? Those aren't the only ways of ordering it, but these are two natural orders that come to mind. So let's go through and start coloring this thing. So, on the left one, you start at the first one and assign it the smallest color that hasn't been used yet. So I'm going to give it color blue. Okay. Now I go to the next one and I assign it the smallest color that hasn't been used yet uh, that I'm allowed to assign it. Right? So two is not next to one, so I can assign it the exact same color. Right? It's the next one in the list. It's not adjacent to one. So I can assign it the color 2. Now I go to 3. 3 I want to assign blue, but I can't because 3 is adjacent to 2 and 2 is blue. So I give 3 a different color. I give it red. Now I go to 4. I want to assign 4 to blue, which is the lowest one, but I can't because it's adjacent to 1, which is blue. So I give it red. And now I go to 5. And the same thing happens. I can't give it blue because it's next to 2. I can't give it red because it's next to four, so I give it green. I go to six, it gets green for the exact same reason, and then I go up to seven, it gets yellow, and eight also gets yellow. So this produces a four coloring of this graph. So when I say N coloring, I mean it, a coloring with that many colors. What would happen if I continued this pattern all the way up? So here I have 4 on each side. What if I had n on each side? Yeah, in general, this is going to give me an n over 2 coloring. So let's do the exact same thing on this other graph. But I'm going to do it in a different order. So I start at 1. 1 doesn't have any colored neighbors yet, so I assign it the color blue. Now I go to 2. 2 is not adjacent to anything that has a color, so I assign it the color blue. 3 is not adjacent to anything that has a color, so I assign it the color 3. 4 is not adjacent to anything that has a color, so I give it the color blue. And now I go to 5. 5 is adjacent to 2, so I can't give it blue, but I can give it red. 6 is adjacent to 1, so I can't give it blue, but it's not adjacent to 5, so I can give it red. Same for 7, and same for 8. So this gives me, this gives me a 2 color. And what happens if I extended this all the way up to n vertices in each column? Nothing. I still get a 2 color. So this tells you that one ordering is really, really good, right? 
This graph on the right, its chromatic number is 2. So I can't possibly do any better than that, and I achieved it. But if I pick the wrong order, I get a coloring that is way, way, way more colors than I need. Right? I only need 2, I used n over 2. That's a huge difference, especially considering the biggest it could be is n. So I'm almost at the maximum anyway. I used way, way more than I needed. And the only thing that changed uh, was the ordering of the vertices that I put in the sequence. And both of these seem like reasonable enough things to do. The problem is, is one results in something good, the other one doesn't. Does anyone have any suggestions for a reasonable order? Question first? This, this is the idea, yes. It's a little bit harder to do in practice, but that's kind of what we'd like to get to. Uh, but even that, it's not clear that that'll always work, because maybe way further down the sequence you get stuck. So what's one reasonable way of ordering the vertices? So it doesn't work in this example, because all the vertices have degree 3. So one good idea One reasonable ordering is by non-increasing degree. So you start with the vertices of big degree, and then you work your way down to the vertices of small degree. So if the largest degree in the graph is delta, Uh, this produces a delta plus one coloring. And I'm not going to prove it, uh, but that's, that's what you get. So if you order the vertices in non-increasing order of degree, then you get a coloring that's pretty good as long as the graph does not have huge degree. Because if it has huge degree, then this isn't that great, right? If the graph has degree n over 2, then this gives you an n over 2 coloring. Now, maybe you couldn't do better, but maybe you could have. Okay? So that's uh, everything I have to say about graph coloring. Uh, any questions about that? So these last two topics are tricky. The stuff I did on planarity and graph coloring is tricky, for sure. Uh, I'm not going to test you in depth on that, but it should give you a nice preview of what you're in store for. So next class, I'm going to do a fairly thorough review. It will likely not take the full hour and a half, so I suggest you come with questions, or worst case scenario, we'll finish early.